life can be really hard, right? Life can be really, really hard. And I feel like we need to be deliberate about inviting pleasure into our life and that we can find pleasure in like the everyday moments and in the small moments. We actually just need to be conscious about it. Like the trauma will be there. You don't need to go searching for it, right? But you need to be like conscious of pleasure and you need to invite it into your life and stay open to those possibilities. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women who have made an impact in Africa. We're talking about their personal, educational and career journeys, the choices they have made along the way and what they have gained by setting aside their doubts in a world where women's voices and opinions often go unheard and unacknowledged. Inspiring Open is a space to explore the value of sisterhood and how networks of sharing and openness can create waves of change. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. My guest on Inspiring Open today is Nana Dakwa Sichiyama. Nana writes across genres, including creative nonfiction, short stories, and essays. She is the author of The Sex Lives of African Women, a book which celebrates African women's journey towards sexual liberation. Nana is the co-founder of Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, an award-winning website, podcast, and festival that publishes and creates content that tell stories of African women's experiences around sex, sexualities, and pleasure. Her short stories have been published in It Wasn't Exactly Love and The Pot and Other Stories. The Guardian, Open Democracy, and Essence have published her articles and opinion editorials. Nana is a huge advocate of pleasure and wants everybody to open up to pleasurable experiences. Let's get into today's conversation. So we'll start from the very beginning and we would like to know where you grew up, how you will describe your upbringing. So as a child, we initially lived with my grandparents in the airport residential area. So my sort of early memories are are of running around in their backyard, which was huge, playing with a watering hose, getting myself wet fallen ill because I'll get myself wet and I was asthmatic and then later on we moved to North Kaneshi and then later on I went to boarding school at quite a young age well I think it was a young age around 12 years old I went to St. Mary's Secondary School in Koligono so yeah I feel like that was kind of like my childhood but I feel like in general I was a uh, I was a fairly happy child, you know, I loved to read, that was my favourite thing to do. I was that kind of child who at a party would go with a book and just sit in the corner and read. Um, Yeah, that's why I wear glasses today. I remember my mum saying to me, you know, if your eyes start to hurt, don't come and complain because she would send me off to bed and she would later find me under the covers trying to read a book with the outside light that was flooding into my bedroom. No wonder you're a writer then. (laughs) <laughs> you loved books at an early age. That's interesting. So between your grandparents and parents, what values were you taught that you still live by? My mom really worked hard to prevent me from being a liar. She used to say I was either going to be a liar or a writer, you know, and I'm a writer, mainly of nonfiction, so I don't even lie most of the time in my books, you know. But as a child, like, I was very creative with the truth. And so she just felt like she had to channel my efforts in the right direction. So I feel like that's actually one of my primary values. I really believe in value honesty. You know, I'm one of those people, I'd rather you tell me the truth, even if it hurts me, even if it upsets me. I hate to be deceived. I hate to be lied to. And maybe that just comes from my mom really emphasizing the need for me to tell the truth when I was young, because I would do things like, you know, go into the fridge and eat my auntie's chocolate and the chocolate would be all over my mouth and they'll say, have you seen the chocolate? I'm like, no. Did you eat the chocolate? I'm like, no. But the evidence is like literally written all over my face. So my mom really like worked on 
getting me to tell the truth. Yeah, and I feel like that's that's one of my primary values in life. Great. Did you always know you were going to be a writer and essentially a storyteller? <laughs> um, absolutely not. Until it was only in 2012 that I started to think of myself as a writer because I attended the, at the time it was called the Farafina Writers Workshop, um, which was a workshop and is a workshop initiated by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And it was going to that workshop that made me feel confident enough to like actually be like, okay, this is something I really want to do. I want to pursue writing as a craft, you know. Um, but when I was a child, I loved acting. That was the thing I used to do, you know. I would act in school plays. I would write school plays. I would direct the school plays. And I really wanted to be an actress. There was a, a time where I vaguely wanted to be a lawyer only because of law and order. But then once I was like in secondary school where my parents were really trying to encourage me to do law, by then I was like, no, I'm not interested. I want to study communications. And I just had this image of myself being like this top shot communications, you know, like PR executive who would be going to fancy dinners and swanning all over the place. Um, (laughs) So communications was really what I wanted to do, which actually is also what I do today. So, yeah, I did achieve my childhood dreams in that regard. But um, as a communications person, are you, you know, living the life of this fancy? (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Not at all, because at the time I had kind of imagined I'll be working in like the corporate world, right? But I'm an activist and I've gravitated towards the feminist world and the NGO world. And yeah, even though in the pre-pandemic days I had a lot of travel as part of my job, it definitely wasn't the kind of swanning around that I was imagining like you don't feel like you're swimming around when you're in economy cramped you know Um, (laughs) so it wasn't that glamorous life I imagined but I really enjoy so many aspects of communications from writing stories to designing campaigns to like you know getting the stories that you think the world needs to know out there in the public eye yeah it's, it's something I feel very passionate about so, Nana, the first time I met you, you worked with AWDF. Can you take me through some of the places you've worked that have defined your career? So I currently work for the Association for Women's Rights and Development, AWID for short, as their Director of Communications and Tactics. I've done that for close to seven years, you know. Um, it's been really interesting. I've gone through, like, the ranks. I started off managing a women's rights and media project that they had with The Guardian and Mama Cash, um, which is another leading women's fund. And yes, I'm currently their director for communications and tactics. And prior to that, I worked with the African Women's Development Fund here in Ghana as their communications specialist. Um, but I've, I've done a variety of things. Um, before that, before working with AWDF, I used to live in the UK and I used to work as a leadership trainer, facilitator and coach for the Metropolitan Police Service, which is something a lot of people don't know about me. So that's also another one of my professional hats, you know, that of being a facilitator, a trainer, and a coach, and something I really enjoy, and I'm hoping to do more in the coming years. Tell me more about your work with the London Metropolitan Police. How did you get that job, and how was that experience? (laughs) Okay, So I was born in the UK, but I wasn't raised there. I was raised here in Ghana. And when I was 19, I went back because I think like a lot of Ghanaians at the time, I felt like the best thing to do was to go to university abroad. Frankly, I wanted to go to university in the States, but I didn't win any scholarships. And so my only option was to go to university in the UK where I could at least, you know, pay fees that were slightly more affordable. So I basically worked all the way through university. You know, I never had the typical university life. I was just like, always had a full-time job and I was studying part-time. And when I finished my first degree, I applied for jobs and didn't get any of the jobs I applied for. And so one time I saw that the, there was an advert in the papers and they said that the police were looking for communication officers. And because I studied communications, I was like, oh, this is up my street. I didn't really understand the details of the job. It was only when I looked further that I realized, oh, the job was actually to be a 999 operator. So basically to be the person who answers the phone when people call the police with an emergency. So 
I did that job. You know, I remember one of my friends was horrified. She was like, how can you as a black person go and work for the police, you know? But I needed a job, you know? And it was a good job and was well paid. And I actually learned a lot. And again, I grew a lot in that role. I quickly became um, one of the internal trainers who then train other people to answer emergency calls. And then later on, I became a leadership trainer where I was responsible for training police officers as well as civilian staff who were managers to be, in a nutshell, better leaders because the police was also trying to, you know, move from being a force to a service, you know, and we're trying to implement some of the recommendations of the McPherson reports, which had um, branded the police as institutionally racist. Um, so, yeah, I spent a year training police officers and staff. It was, in many ways the most stressful period of my life, but it was also the period where I learned the most. Um, I discovered I had a skill for facilitation, you know, um, in a sense, just creating the conditions that help people reflect, that help people, you know, discuss, that help people open up. But then it was like every two weeks you had a new class and that was a stressful thing because you kind of have the first day where they're like, you know, big burly police officers looking at you, this African girl, and like, there was like I was the first black leadership trainer you know I was the first black African leadership trainer I was the first black African woman leadership trainer so you have them sort of kind of looking at you like what can you teach me and then you know within a like say two days you've broken down the barriers you're all getting along but you always have that stress on day one and you would have that stress repeated every two weeks (laughs) which was a lot you know um And obviously, you had to also deal with a certain amount of ignorance, you know, um, and you had to do a lot of education. But it was always good by the second week. But it was just sort of stressful every week, sort of amping yourself up to be with a group that come across as hostile, but that you know you can win over. Um, But I feel like it's one of those experiences that, like I mentioned earlier, I learned the most from. So I'm never nervous you know, going into any situation, because I kind of feel like if I could deal with that and succeed, I can deal with anything. How and why were you drawn into the world of activism and feminism, to be specific? So when I was 19 and I was studying um, my first degree, one of my courses was cultural studies, and feminist theory was a part of that. So I read books by people like Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins, Alice Walker, and for me, it was like somebody had turned on the lights, like you were sitting in darkness and somebody turned on the lights and now you can see everything clearly. Everything those feminists said made sense to me. I was like, oh, so this is why that used to happen. You know, this is why the world is the way it is. They just sort of explained the way the world is to me and it made complete sense. And then I just started reading reading more and more about feminism and everything I read just made sense to me. And I felt like I just want to continue studying this. So then I went on to, I mean, do many different things. There was an African women's organization in the UK at the time called Akina Mama Wa Africa. It still exists today, but they moved their head office to Uganda. So I signed on to volunteer for them, and I'll just go to their offices and work for free. But part of what was really great was they had all of these leadership courses. So as a volunteer, they would send me to their leadership courses, and I learned a lot from other African feminists. And then I also got to connect with other young African feminists, And that was basically what started me on a lifelong journey of activism, you know. And then having that experience also, when I came to Ghana, it made it easier for me to get a job with, you know, an African feminist organization. And that's really what set me on my journey. You know, unfortunately for so many people, feminism has this negative connotation. Have you experienced such negativity before? I feel like... Those are the kind of experiences that I used to have when I was much, much younger. But nowadays, I move in the world with my people and with my community. I do not spend time in spaces, to be honest, where I feel like these are people who don't get me or don't understand me. So I sound myself a feminist. I don't get those, those kind of reactions today. And I'll probably just move out of a space. I love to live in my feminist echo chamber. I'm quite happy there. Good. You're a member of the Black Feminism Forum. Why Black feminist? And even for that matter, why African feminist? Someone may ask, can't we all exist as feminists? Like I describe myself, I don't describe myself as a Black feminist. I describe myself as an African feminist, right? 
And for me, what that means is that my feminism is informed by my context. It's informed by where I come from. You know, for me, it's also a way to connect my identities as a Pan-Africanist and as a feminist. So there may be issues that or particular concerns that white feminists have. That may not be issues that I relate to, right? Because, like, we have different realities. And so being an, an African feminist for me is about dealing with the realities of being African and also, you know, one of my primary concerns being the well-being of the continent. You've mentioned that you don't worry so much about what others think about you and the work you do because you found your tribe. How life-changing has finding that tribe been? It's been everything, right? Because I think sometimes you may feel like alone in the world or feel like you're the only one who feels a particular way. But when you find your tribe, you realize, oh my gosh, I am normal. There's so many people like me. You know, we have the same belief system. We have the same politics. We're fighting for the same cause. Um, They make my world better. They lift me up. They support me. I don't need to explain myself. I don't need to have arguments with them, you know? So it's everything to find a tribe. And it's the thing that I would encourage people to invest energy in, whatever your passion is, finding people who are like-minded, who support you, who love you, who care for you, who lift you up and who are there for you. And I feel like that's what African feminists do for me. Yeah, tribes are important. What are your thoughts about putting literature into categories? So... There is African feminist literature, for instance. Again, why can't it just exist as literature? I know that sometimes some writers feel that you narrow them if you describe them as, say, an African woman writer or a feminist writer. I personally have no problem with that because my identity is so important to me. Right. And because part of why I write, because my identity is part of why I write, I have no problem with being defined according to my identity. I also don't think it limits, you know, who accesses my book. So with my book, for example, The Sex Lives of African Women, people may feel like, oh, you know, does that mean men want to be interested in reading? I know some men read it, but I primarily wrote this book for women. So even if no man read it, I wouldn't be bothered, right? So I've had men like DM me and tell me how much the book means to them and they're buying it for other women and all of that kind of stuff. So even if somebody described my book as, you know, African feminist literature, I would have no problem with it because I'm actually really proud to write African feminist literature. Some people also like to pretend that there is no such thing as African feminist or some people like to pretend that feminism is a Western import. And as African feminists, we also are reclaiming the stories of our African feminist ancestors, right? So for me, that's also like part of not just the reclaiming, but naming the work we do and having that name recognized. And also being able to like point attention to the knowledge that we produce as African feminists. Now let's talk about the adventures from the bedrooms of African women. The blog has been in existence for 14 years. Yep, January 2009. I feel before some of these topics on sex and sexuality became trendy in Ghana, you and your co-founder had been on it. What led to the start of the blog? So a couple of things, right? Um, One, I had become interested in blogging as a communication specialist. I was really curious about, you know, how could the blog format help us tell stories and so I was, I was exploring and I started a blog for the AWDF, the African Women's Development Fund. And I used to go to these meetings, monthly meetings, uh, by blog in Ghana. And, you know, two of the bloggers, Kaiza and Nanayao, were like, oh, why don't you have a personal blog? And I was like, I have nothing to blog about. And then later on that year, I went on holiday with a group of my friends and we went to the Western region, we were on the beach you know, drinking cocktails and chilling and having lots of conversations about sex. And it felt to me like the first time where I was having really open-minded, non-judgmental conversations with other African women about sex. And I just thought, why has it taken me so long to actually be able to do this so freely? And so I came back and I called Malika and we were chatting and I was telling her how amazing my holiday was. And Malika was that one friend that I could always share intimate secrets with, you know, and she with me. And so I said to her, look, I want to start a blog about sex. And she said to me, she's been wanting to write a blog. She's been wanting to write a book. 
about sex. And so I said, let's do the blog together and later on we can turn the blog into a book. And that's how Adventures came into being. Was it a blog that was readily, say, patronized by people because of the topics you discussed? I would say it was readily patronized because the stories were interesting and they were regular. <laughs> but yes, of course, sex sells, right? When I mean, we don't have enough knowledge about sex. So when you're writing about sex and you're writing about sex in a way that people can access, they have their questions answered, they're going to read it. They're going to consume that information because there's such a dearth of like comprehensive knowledge about sex. Yeah, so the blog got lots of readers very, very quickly. And I think also it probably got lots of readers in the beginning because I was myself. You know, I had my picture up on the blog. I had my name up on the blog. I wasn't trying to hide myself. And I think that made it interesting for people. But I don't know. There's been lots of anonymous blogs about sex where, you know, those blogs have done very well. So maybe the popularity had nothing to do with me being open. I think it had more to do with the, with the topic. Yeah, and the fact that the quality of the writing was good. You began writing the blog yourself and later allowed for others to contribute. Why did you see the need to open it up? I very quickly had the realization that, you know, this blog is called Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. It's not called Adventures from the Bedrooms of Nanada Akwa. You know, and of course, women were sending me messages, you know, sharing their stories with me, the DMs. So I just started encouraging people. I'm like, you know, the story that you just told me, do you want to write it for the blog? Do you want to share? There were some people who started writing regularly. And so, like, literally, we gave them their own username and password to the blog. These are women I had never met. Many of them I've still never met. And we just gave them access to the blog so that whenever they wanted to write a story, they could publish. And I think that was also a huge part of the success of the blog because then we had women who came from different backgrounds, different identities. So then there were many more stories in the blog. The blog was being regularly populated, you know, um, and there was always new and exciting content there. If I had tried to do it myself, I'm sure at some point in time, I'd have probably just gotten tired. You know, that's open right there. Exactly. It, yeah, it was totally open. It was totally open. Yeah. And I, I, you know, like my trust was never betrayed, to be honest. The degree to which I trusted the community on adventures, like sometimes I think about it now and I'm like, whoa, was that stupid? But I don't think so. I feel like my faith in people was returned several times. I'll give you an example. You know, there was a time where someone wrote to me and said, I have a visual disability. There was a change we'd done to the blog. And this change was really affecting me and they were trying to give me tips on how to correct it. I couldn't. It turned out that person had some sort of IT skills. I basically gave them an admin password and they fixed the issues. This is, again, somebody I didn't know. They could have taken down the blog for all I knew, right? But I just, also, I didn't have money to, like, we were paying for everything in terms of the domain name and server, like, hosting with our own resources. I didn't have extra money to go and hire, like, a website specialist you know so even in those early days fixes were done like by community members I mean I moved from blog post from blogger to WordPress because you know the founder and owner of Web for Africa did that for me for free and he was somebody who had met in blogging circles as well so it was such a community effort adventures has been such a community effort up to this day yeah, it's only recently that we've had some resources where we can now afford to like have professionals to do things for us. Yeah, and and I, you know, again, I like how, how far Adventures has come because I also saw that now you have a fellowship program. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I mean, like we mentioned earlier from the very beginning, and I started to encourage other women to share their stories. Lots of people became regular contributors. With their own time, they'll be writing for adventures on a regular basis, maybe like, you know, one story every week, one story every two weeks. Um, a lot of people have honed their craft as a writer on adventures and over a period of time have become better writers because they've been writing regularly. And we just felt like we wanted to create a system where we could give something back, right? We could give somebody, you know, a couple of people and an aerarium. We could also offer them more structured support. Um, more consistent editorial support. We could create like online trainings that they could benefit from. We could 
have other more experienced creatives, you know, have mentoring sessions with them. And so that's what we're trying to do with the fellowship. Amazing. The topics on sexuality in particular feature on the blog from the very beginning. Yes, we've always discussed the issues of sexuality because the one thing the blog has also been for me is like, and just in general, writing, right? Writing is the way that, like writing is a way for me to think, you know? So if I'm trying to figure something out, I write it. And in the process of writing, I come to a clear understanding, you know? And I mean, when I was 19 and I started to read about sexuality, I was having a lot of aha moments because I had never previously thought of my sexuality. I had just kind of, like, I just never questioned, like, oh, do I have a sexuality? What is a sexuality? You know, like I was a typical Ghana girl. All you know is that sex is bad and you shouldn't have sex. And I thought I hadn't ever had sex. I hadn't thought of the experiences I'd had with other girls in my boarding school as sex. So when I started to reflect on my sexuality, that's part of what I was reflecting on. And I would write about that on the blog, you know. So, yeah, we've been talking about sexuality since 2009. It's not anything that's new for us. And, you know, I don't think it's anything that's new for Africans in general. It's just that we have a lot of religious fundamentalists who try and whip up hysteria around sexuality and who try to pretend that Africans only have one sexuality, which we know is completely false. Nana, you're in Ghana. And you have witnessed the debate on sexuality to the point that there's a bill being pushed in Parliament to criminalize it. I wonder how you feel about it. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay, so much that I want to respond to that. I didn't know where to start from. Well, I personally feel sexuality is on the spectrum. Um, I don't think that sexuality is fixed. I don't think it's immutable. I think people's sexuality can change. Some people may might may experience their sexuality as fixed. Others may not, right? Um, I think what's important is that everybody's human rights are respected, and nobody should be discriminated against or abused because of their sexuality. And I think states, including the states of Ghana, has a responsibility to protect sexual minorities. And actually, Ghana has signed a number of international um, covenants to say that they will protect the rights of sexual minorities. So it's really upsetting when we allow religious people to try and hold sway over the country, especially as a country, as a country is a secular country. Um, For me, that's really upsetting. And what's even more upsetting, and upsetting is not the right word, um, but, you know, there's a lot of hate that sexual minorities experience in this country. And when people try and talk about people who are sexual minorities as if they are not human beings, it fosters and increases the hate for them and their real consequences for people's lives. You know, this makes this, uh, yeah, people are being threatened, people are being abused, people are being beaten, people are losing their jobs. And I think it's a really disgraceful place for Ghana to be in. And I guess maybe I was overly optimistic about Ghana, but I had never expected us to be here. You know, I hope the bill gets killed. um, And I hope not only does the bill get killed, but that, you know, these conversations would have hopefully helped some Ghanaians to understand that we are all one people and that we all have the right to be here. And that we all have the right to live in peace and to be secure. And we have the right to love whoever we want to love, you know. And what our government should be doing is making all our lives better. You know, making sure we have the basic necessities. We have good health care. We have education. That's what I want our governments to focus on. Rather than focus on who is sleeping with who. That's not the state's business. You know, as long as people are consenting adults... You know, what they do is their business. And what the state should be doing is providing health care such that adults can be safe. Um, we have many problems when it comes to sex. We have a huge problem of pedophilia. And this is, you know, <laughs> actually being done by the heterosexuals. So the homosexuals are not the people that we need to fear, you know. Um, in my book, a lot of people shared about the child 
abuse experienced. And the experience that abuse usually was, I mean, like, obviously, as interviewed women, you know, they were abused by men, older men, people in their families, people who were relatives. You know, we, we see this in the papers all of the time, girls being defiled, you know. For me, that's a bigger concern we should be dealing with. Yeah, yeah. I think the hypocrisy is just too much. Congratulations on your book, Nana, The Sex Lives of African Women. Tell me how the process of putting together the book was like. It was such a long process. <laughs> it took me five years, you know, and there were many times where I was like, would I ever finish this book? Should I just give up and publish the stories I have on the blog? But I'm glad I persevered and, you know, um, eventually was published in book format. The idea came in 2014 and I actually started the writing and interviewing process in 2015 and I finished in 2020. You know, um, yeah, so it was a long process, but it was interesting. It was fun. Um, what I would do is anytime I traveled to a new country, I would seek out an African woman to interview because I wanted to show the diversity of our stories, you know, across the world. And I'd also like realized rather belatedly, oh, we have African descendants in places like Latin America, which I'd never thought about. Right. So I wanted people to also see that reality in my book. But why did it take five years? Is it um, the process of getting the interviews or you had all the interviews down, but it still took five years? Yeah, I had a full-time job <laughs> and many other like side hustles, right? I had a full-time job. I had the blog, you know, I have a small consultancy. Towards the end, I had a daughter, you know, so it, it wasn't a full-time thing. Like there'll be months where I would go without writing you know, or interviewing anybody and then maybe I'll do a residency and then I'll work on 10 stories at a go. So it was very much written in fits and spurts until I got my book deal. And when you have a book deal and somebody's giving you money and you have signed a contract to say you need to deliver your book by a certain deadline, you will wake up at five o'clock to write every day, which is what I did in the, in the long run. <laughs> well, congratulations all the same. I am glad it finally came out. For someone who needs convincing to pick a copy of the book, why is the book a must read? I would say there's no book like it, you know, and those are not just my words. Those are the words of Margaret Busby, who is like a preeminent um, black woman publisher in, in the UK. But then also like everyday women DM me all of the time and they tell me the book has changed their lives. The book has made them you know, reflect on their sexuality, reflect on their choices. It's inspired them to, you know, seek more pleasure in their life. Um, and so a lot of women have told me that the book is life-changing. Um, and yeah, that's why I would encourage everybody to get the book if they don't already have it and not to just get one for yourself, but to get one for your sisters and your friends and your brothers and your mothers I love that so many people have told me that they bought a book for their mom and some people have told me they're keeping a copy for their daughters you know that's really nice you are very vulnerable with some aspects of your life on social media and I think a few years ago you shared about your struggles of trying to have a baby where was your headspace that time when you made the post and now that you have a daughter, how does it feel? Yeah, motherhood is way more challenging than I imagined it would be. I had no idea that even up until almost two years old, my daughter would not sleep through the night. <laughs> I wish I'd known that from the beginning, you know. Um, to be honest, I can't remember the headspace I was in when I wrote that original post. But for many years, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a mother or not. I was really in two minds, you know. Um, and then obviously I made the decision to pursue motherhood and yeah I feel like I just want to be real about motherhood I love my daughter with all my heart I'm so glad she's in my life it's freaking hard work I'm glad I didn't do that when I was young I'm glad I did it in my 40s you know when I'm financially stable enough to be able to have somebody super qualified to support me as a living nanny you know um and I don't plan to have a second child because I still want to have lots of space and time in my life to be able to pursue my own creative projects. 
And, you know, even now I have less time to, to write, for example, because I used to wake up and write at five. But anytime I wake up, my daughter wakes up. So even if I'm awake, I have to lie quietly in bed so that she can continue sleeping. And I think nobody really warns you, you know, about all of those kind of things. And I think also being a mother has convinced me that nobody should be like forcing people to become mothers because you do have to give up so much of yourself. And hopefully it's a short term thing, right? Because obviously as the children grow, they become more independent. And at some point in time, they wouldn't even want to be by you. But at this point in time, my daughter just wants to be by me. Like I had to say to my nanny, I'm going to do a podcast. Please make sure that you guys don't come this way. Because if she comes down the corridor, she's going to come into my office. And she's going to come and sit on my lap. You know, even in the middle of the night, if I wake up and go to the bathroom, she wakes up and follows me to the bathroom. So she's got severe attachment issues. (laughs) But it's also sweet, right? Because she loves me. And she wants to be around me all of the time. But sometimes it's just like, oh my goodness, please give me five minutes. I just want to be in the bathroom on my own, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a mother, but I can imagine. I, I, I can imagine that. And, you know, like you, you read stories and you hear people's experiences about how the process of trying to become a mother is. And then I had to like see it firsthand, uh, what my sister had to go through to eventually have a child and she would also say that you know what Betty when it happens it happens if it hasn't happened sit your somewhere and relax because yes like you want it you yearn it but it's not an easy process at all as you know people would make it seem like hey go get a baby hey you know when are you having a baby when are you doing that but absolutely yeah and it's kind of ironic because when you think especially when you're young like you have this fear of if I have sex, I fall pregnant, almost as if it's automatic. And it really isn't for a lot of women, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it really isn't for most women. And I just wish the narrative would change on that. Because when you become an adult and it doesn't happen automatically for you, it messes with your head. But hey, what do I know? <laughs> I think you clearly know a lot. But yes, I think... We should delink sex from pregnancy because it's not automatically connected. And, you know, I don't think we should be saying to people as a deterrent, like if you have sex, you fall pregnant. I think what we should be doing is really giving people the options, you know, um, when it comes to pleasure, explaining that you can have pretty damn good sex by yourself. You can have sex with toys. And, you know, here's a whole range of protection if you do want to have sex with somebody else. Here's how you can keep yourself safe. That's what I think we should be doing. Not saying to people, don't have sex, because if you have sex, you know, you'll fall pregnant and your life will be destroyed. Absolutely. Now let's talk about open and what it means to you. So what does open mean to me? I think it means different things. I think it means making knowledge as accessible as possible, preferably free or a lot of it free. You know, I think it means having it available in multiple formats, you know, in multiple languages. Um, But the format for me is really important. So it's something that people can read, they can hear, they can feel, they can touch. Um, I think you should want something that's open. It doesn't really belong to one person. It belongs to a collective or it belongs to everybody, right? Um, I also think when something is open, it's done in collaboration. Um, Yeah, for me, these are a couple of indicators of something being open. You know, like I said early on, a lot of the work you do is really rooted in open, from opening up your blog to strangers who have made it even better over the years, to pushing for inclusion for women and sexual minorities. You are open more than you know. Thank you for saying that. In what way do you want conversations on sex, sexuality and feminism to change? I want the conversations to become more open. (laughs) Riffing on the theme of being open, you know. No, I really want us to be more open-minded and to allow ourselves to unlearn some of the things we've been taught by our society, by our parents allow ourselves to relearn, to educate ourselves, to listen to people who may be different from us, who may have different experiences. Um, 
yeah, just to have an open-minded approach, really, towards sex and sexuality, even for ourselves as individuals. I think it always starts with the self. I realize that you emphasize on pleasure a lot, particularly on adventures, and of course, you know, an extension of that pleasure in other areas of your life. Why the emphasis? Because life can be really hard, right? Life can be really, really hard. And I feel like we need to be deliberate about inviting pleasure into our life and that we can find pleasure in like the everyday moments and in the small moments. We actually just need to be conscious about it. And so, yeah, that's the focus for me on pleasure. Like the trauma will be there. You don't need to go searching for it, right? But you need to be like conscious of pleasure and you need to invite it into your life and stay open to those possibilities. Thank you, Nanama, for not backing down despite the abuse and all the attempts to silence you. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the Chairman Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. Thank you.